I says when they are young, or when they are early, come to you as an editor. Uh, you really can't take any credit for it. This is a piece I'm calling The Place of Place. And I want to talk about four different ways of looking at the word place as it relates to fiction and to fiction writers. I'll begin with place as origins, that is the geography and culture, roughly speaking, where the writer chanced to enter the world. I'd like to explore after that place as education, how and where fiction writers learn their craft or resist learning it. And then I'll try to talk briefly about the use of place in fiction. This will be a shorter segment, since what I have to say is either obvious, or self-evident, or just plain stupid. <clears throat> Finally, I'll consider the importance of a place within the writer, a place where the wellsprings of imagination, and experience, and memory, and all that concatenation of factors that comprise the so-called creative process exist. Four parts neat, neater and simpler than the truth. I'm really more interested in Q&A than I am in speechifying. So bear with us and then we'll talk and have some fun. <laughs> It's a curious biological fact that in animals, there's a similarity between the physiological structure of the retina of the eye and the natural environment in which the animal lives. I say that this is the case in animals of a lesser order than man, and it may be true in humans, humans as well. I'm not enough of a biologist to know such things. And it's pure accident that I know it to be the case with other animals. Whatever the scientific truth is, the fact remains that if you look at a microscopic section of the retina of an animal whose habitat is open spaces, the physiology of the retina will resemble those open spaces. There will be a ground of darker shades. There will be a high area a significantly lighter appearance, and there will seem to be a horizon line separating the two. If, on the other hand, you consider the same microscopic cross-section of the retina of an animal whose habitat is, say, a jungle or a rainforest, you will see no such openness and no such horizon. Instead, you will be looking at a veritable jungle of veins and capillaries and you may very easily imagine that you are looking at a tropical landscape of trees and vines. Animals live, apparently, in worlds which are horizontal or vertical and are so perceived, worlds which are open or closed and are so perceived. My own home, my birthplace, the place where I was brought up for the first 20 years of my life, it's the state of Maine. Maine is a place of ocean and forest. The ocean suggesting eternity and restlessness and a pattern of rhythm so relentless that granite wears away in the face of it. While the forest suggests the extraordinary ripeness of the earth, a fertility which is perennial, not merely annual. Both ocean and forest also manage to convey the notion of natural disinterest. No matter what you do in the forest, it grows back. No matter what you do to the ocean, it endures. Alice Moreau, the wonderful Canadian writer, has said this, I guess that as a writer, I'm a kind of anachronism, because I write about places where your roots are, and most people don't live that kind of life anymore at all. Most writers, probably, the writers who are most in tune with our time write about places that have no texture because this is where most of us live. 
I like to consider places that do have texture. It's a clipping from a newspaper that was sent to me quite a few years ago by a former student of mine who spent several years in the Peace Corps in East Africa. That's the headline from the clipping. Man kills baboon after fierce fight. A 30-year-old man had recently fought fiercely with a baboon and managed to kill it with his bare hands. Mr. Ajabu Nawa of the Yenyo village in the area of Chief Kalembo in Machinga sustained injuries on his arms, legs, and other parts of the body in the fight with a baboon, locally known as Chendayeka, which had killed his dog. According to the area party chairman from Wimba, Mr. Mustafa Brown, Mr. Noah had gone to inspect his maize field along with his dog. When his dog spotted the baboon, it chased the animal, and a fight ensued between dog and baboon. The baboon managed to overpower and kill the dog. After killing the dog, the baboon went for Mr. Noah, who was not armed. After a fierce fight, Mr. Noah is said to have grabbed the jaws of the enraged animal and jerked them apart, thereby killing the animal. Imagine an Iowa farmer going out one summer morning to check the progress of the corn crop. Dog at his heels, nothing on his mind but the everyday agony of being a farmer in a capitalist society. No baboons in his future. No battles to the death. No exciting story to tell a reporter from the local paper. Sometimes I wish we had something like that in the world. We're safer in a world without baboons, but we're the, poor, the poorer for that in the sense that the texture of our lives is smoother, less interesting. In a way, it's as if the frontiers that used to be so challenging to us have stopped and backed up on us, forcing us to live in a smaller territory, forcing us to be more narrowly regional. Civilization is a terrible thing that way. If we identify ourselves only with a single place, then whatever goes on outside that place may very well become a threat to us. Inside our personal places, we make enemies of intruders from outside them. We are suspicious of different skin color, different religion, different clothes and haircuts. Inside our political places, we come to distrust people from other states, other geographies, other countries. In short, we become Republicans. <laughs> Anyone with a good ear can detect my main accent. It's especially true if I had a couple of drinks. <laughs> it comes back. Though I tried for years to get rid of it, all those broad A's and dropped R's, because I thought it made me sound like a hick. And whenever I travel, I make geographical comparisons to the state of Maine. Watching the waves on the Oregon coast recently, I could only remember the waves against the Maine coast 3,000 miles away. And how charming it is to remember friends in Maine who are so humane that they hypnotize the lobster they're about to boil alive so the creature will feel, they believe, no pain. You know about this? He struck the back of the carapace and it supposedly soothes the lobster into kind of a trance. And then, the end of it all. How evocative it is to hear the cries of gulls. How exciting to watch seals cavorting in the rocks just offshore. How satisfying to stand on a bluff looking west to find an ocean, across an ocean inlet, and to see the peaks of Mount Adams in Mount Washington, a hundred miles away in New Hampshire. I think Alice Munro is correct when she says that most of us no longer live the kind of life that has roots. And what she means when she says that rootless writers are more in, in tune with our times. I guess in a way I want to argue about that. Um, 
Plain truth is, I believe the only important place is the one out of which we create the world. Whether it's a world of language, of society, of nature, of fiction. That's our real home. An open place. I'm not saying, as E. e. Cummings once said, listen, there's a hell of a good universe next door, let's go. I'm saying there's a hell of a good place right here, let's use it. I'll come back to this and try to make better sense out of it. Writers who presume to teach don't usually give lectures. When we set out to discuss the craft of fiction, matters of plot and character, setting, dialogue, story arcs, and then laws, and the rules of using them, inevitably we arrive at a point in the discussion where we are obliged to say, but of course there are no rules. This contradiction, here is how we think fiction works, but never mind, was perhaps the original premise of what is now the I.O. Writers Workshop when it began in the early 1930s. It recognized that lectures on craft beg the question of craft, and that a better way to carry on the discussion was to treat particular fictional problems and find rules by inference rather than fiat. Over these many years, the model has endured. Writers' workshops have long since gone viral. There are hundreds of them, some good, most of them not. To my mind, Iowa is still the best of them. I can think of only one genuine challenger, a much larger, more loosely knit classroom that you call Brooklyn. The similarities are obvious. Both attract younger writers to live in an atmosphere of normal occupation, and where they live in the shadow of older and more accomplished practitioners of the craft. In a place ripe with talent, some of it, they believe, will rub off. I was a student in the Iowa program long ago, and I've also taught in it. I can tell you that a third advantage of that place, and places that aspire to it, is the exposure to the infinite varieties of literary taste. Students bring their own preconceptions about good writing, and if all goes well, those preconceptions are gradually eroded, and the students are led to see that every story has its own rules, its own integrity. In short, the story knows what it wants to be, and in a contest between what the author wants to say and what the story wants to say, the story has to win. Younger writers, I can't call them beginning writers because in Iowa, the incoming, incoming students are experienced. Many of them are already published. Some of them are even attached to agents. Younger writers also need contact with men and women whose successes are exemplary. This is important and useful. T.C. Boyle has said that when John Cheever praised a story of his, he was encouraged to feel that his life was going in the right direction. I can recall that when Kurt Vonnegut didn't like a story of mine, I was flattered that he took the time to tell me why, even though I thought his judgment was quite wrong-headed. It's worth noting, I think, that most of the visiting writers who lead workshops at Iowa are not professorial types. They are not even necessarily very good teachers by the usual academic definitions. What they do bring are lessons of patience, of eccentricity, of insights into the workings, the uncertainties and frequent idiocies in the publishing world that their students are about, that the students are ambitious to enter. These non-teaching teachers bring a temperament and stability hard to find anywhere else in the liberal world. Ultimately, all writers learn by doing, reading as much as they can, writing as much as they can. And you can do that without ever setting foot inside a writer's workshop, the way hundreds of writers have done and possibly will continue to do. Though the availability of the academic model still threatens to delete the product. As James M. Cain once put it, 
Novel writing is something else. It has to be learned, but it can't be taught. This bunkum and stinkum of college creative writing courses, exclamation point. The academics don't know that the only thing you can do for someone who wants to write is to buy him a typewriter. Those are the reasons. And here's a suggestion from Boyle. Take the writers out of the classes, put them in dark cells with a plug for their monitors, a slot at the top of the door for pizza, and a slot at the bottom for waste. Every time a finished story comes back out that top slot, you write them a check for a thousand dollars in six months without Tolstoy. Now here's some obvious stuff, the use of plays. I noted earlier that I'm early from the state of Maine. At 20, I left Maine to work on a newspaper in Texas. Spent four years in the Air Force in Texas and West Germany. Came home to finish school in Maine and Iowa, and then spent more than 40 years in the Midwest. Throughout those peregrinations, I was writing. Not publishing, but always writing. And in all those different places, I used those surroundings in my fiction and poetry. I wrote Texas stories, I wrote Germany stories, I wrote Indiana stories, I wrote Iowa stories. And I ret retired to Florida from the business of teaching. God help me, I wrote Florida stories. It took me 50, roughly 50 adult years to come to the re realization that I had given short shrift to my native state. That if it is true, as I once read, that we've learned all we need to know about life by the time we turn 21, everything else is just variations on the theme, then I have been ignoring a storehouse of knowledge that demanded exploration. So I began at last to recreate a fictional world of Maine in ways not in the like faultless creation of the South as Dr. Patafa County. And I'm not suggesting the two creations are equal. And as my short-term memory becomes less reliable, my recollections of my hometown, especially compared to the town as it exists today, have served as a kind of armature on which much of my more recent fiction is built. And I'm sorry I waited so long. Stephen Miner, a fellow writer and a dear friend, who died a couple of years ago, used to be critical of short stories whose openings seemed to postpone the plot. And he was especially impatient with me when I would devote two or three manuscript pages to describing the place where the story was to unfold. Steve believed one should hook the reader in the first or second sentence, lest the reader lose interest. He might have approved of the opening of one of Max Schulman's novels, the one called Sleep to the Moon, which begins, bang, 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 four shots ripped into my groin. The next sentence begins, but first let me tell you a little bit about myself. <laughs> to my mind, there's nothing wrong with short stories that have leisurely openings. Openings that can set a scene, establish a style, create an atmosphere that will pervade the story to come. My own story, I really wanted to give a reading here sometime, so this is my, my chance to sink in a paragraph. My story, Charm, begins. The Maurice Ducharme School is a three-story brick building at the corner of Thompson and Mason Streets in Skagen, Maine. The brick is of two colors, sand, beige, accented with scarlet in a stepped pattern at the building's four corners and around the entrance doors. The doors themselves are of weathered oak, the windows high and small paved. The walks in front of Duchamp are of WPA cement with occasional squares of newer, raw white stuff. The school was built in the early 1930s, nearly 60 years ago, and has had no updating except for a new roof 
after the 1938 hurricane. It houses all 12 grades of the town's Catholic school children. It also houses, at the basement level, the St. Ignatius Church, one of two Catholic churches in town, the other being Holy Family on the west side of the river. Most of the townspeople, but especially the Protestants, refer to Ducharme as the parochial school. The children who attend it sometimes call it, not always sarcastically, the charm school. So the place, name, the time, nineties, age, and tradition are presented. A social milieu is given in a time divided between Catholic and non-Catholic. Now we're ready to meet the players. I don't mean to suggest that the only use of place is to establish setting and tone, but it's the most common. And I suppose one of the most famous is from a novel. The most compelling inscription that I've ever read is the opening chapter of Daphne de Maurier's, Daphne de Maurier's Rebecca, the one that begins last night. I dreamt I went to Manjoli again. I won't be lost Is this what I'm doing? I don't have to do it. Something suddenly changed. Finally, a place within us, writers and readers alike, a place of secrets. Experience, memory, images, geography, language, it's all here. People we've met, words we've spoken and listened to, faces that are half forgotten or so unforgotten that they haunt our dreams and our 3 a.m. wakefulness. Here are the actions we're proud of, the deeds that shame us, the men and women we loved, and the ones we betrayed, the promises made and broken, the appointments kept, the commitments taken seriously or not. All these are the grist of fiction. We eke them out in the stories we write, parceling out our own faults and our own virtues to define the characters in our stories. All those versions of ourselves good and bad, designed in the end to make us look better than we were, or at least different from what we are. We give our crimes to sympathetic villains, our good deeds to noble protagonists, our petty faults to peripheral characters who flesh out the text and contribute to verisimilitude. This is the hard part of writing, because it requires honesty, but not so much honesty that the reader will be embarrassed. It's honesty that gives authority to a story, that reassures the reader that he or she can trust the writer who wrote it. But to be too honest, to reveal the author, not the character, in full confessional mode, that's not fiction. That's not art. That's begging forgiveness for all the complicated transgressions we've been keeping to ourselves. I guess that's why creative nonfiction was invented, so the writer can have it both ways.